We'll see what this long beard will do. This week on Kentucky Afield. That's what I'm looking for. We're talking turkey and patterning shotguns with a Kentucky hunting legend, Mr. Harold Knight. Ooh, we. What are you talking about? <laughs> Next. You can see this one really good, the, the growth lines on it. Zebra mussels are a species that we want no part of in this state. So it's problematic, it's a nuisance species. We're talking to the experts to find out how to limit their spread. Then, fishing season is upon us. Here we go. We're catching trout at Wolf Creek Dam. Let that rod tip do the work. Yep. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plumb loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> first Saint Leo. Yeah. Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Preparing for this upcoming turkey season takes a lot more than just sharpening your skills on your calls. Maybe the most important part is choosing the right ammo and patterning your shotgun. Well, Harold, turkey season is right around the corner. That's right here on us, brother. You know, the crazy thing about turkey hunting is it's changing every year, and it's changing fast. To keep up with all the new trends, you really got to spend a little time. You know, you do, and I try to read up on it and keep up with it, and I tell you what, it's a full-time job to do that now. Absolutely. You know, we had you on a calling show about four years ago, and you said something that at the time I remember thinking, that's pretty radical, and that was you were going to turkey hunt that year with a tungsten load shooting nine shot. That's correct, and I was amazed the difference between it and lead. And you got so many more shot, several hundred more. Yeah. And it is unreal what it do. More energy downrange. So if you can sight your gun in in a way that you can take a bird at 50, 60 yards, and they build choke tubes now specifically for a particular type of ammunition and show you exactly how it should pattern. Seems like every year somebody's coming out with new chokes. You said you're hunting with a 20 gauge this year. 12 gauge has been the standard. You're right, I'm shooting a 20 gauge now over a 12. Predominantly because of tungsten ammo. It's been a game changer, these tungsten shells and dot scopes and things, it really has. Well, I happen to have bought a new 20 gauge this year and I've bought a, a gun that I plan on using in the field for a whole range of outdoor recreation from sporting clays to dove to rabbit to turkey. And I never thought I'd be making a transition to a 20 gauge. But let's gather up some ammo and, uh, you know, we came down here to talk turkey. We're also going to shoot some guns and pattern our turkey guns for this year. I want to learn a few things from you and hopefully when I leave today, I feel confident that my gun is ready to go. Good deal. All right, let's give it a shot right here and see where we're at. So we want to fine tune it with the ammo you're going to shoot, but get on the paper and make sure you're getting close with your less expensive load. That's right. Far in a hole. I see a lot of green. Not bad, it's close. Okay. I'm gonna go get it, we're gonna bring it back, and we're gonna look and see where we're at. All right. Let's put another target out while we're there. You know, I can see a pretty good pattern, looks like. He's a dead turkey. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the spine and head there. But it looks like to me, the pattern still is just a teeny bit low. And I think that might be just to the left, just a little. We need to make just a little adjustment and shoot another shell. All I'm right. gonna shoot a TSS this time. Okay. It's a tungsten shell, so you got a few more shots. A few more shots. Yeah, and I've adjusted my gun, so let's see what he does. All right. All right, bar in the hole. All right, let's go see where we're at. That's what I'm looking for. I want you to look here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 in the red kill, not counting the other kills. I believe that gun's ready to hunt. That gun is ready. All right, let's try a long beard. Number we'll just, five shot. We'll show the exact same gun, same choke tube with a lead shot, long beard XR. Which is a great shell. It's you know a what? great round. Let's just see what the difference is. All right, let's see what this long beard will do. All right. The wind blew it down there, walking up here, but that's a dead turkey. You can see we've got the gun right. Mm -hmm. Look, look at the pattern there. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But, I'm impressed with that. But the difference is the amount of holes in there. And these are five shot, a lot bigger shot, but they weigh the same. So yeah. the amount of energy that you've got here, not near as much as the tungsten shot that you put on there before. I recommend that we bring this in to about 35 yards and shoot your gun and shoot with a regular shell okay. and see where the pattern is. All right, let's do that. I've never shot this gun through this turkey choke tube, so what we're going to do is use this bigger target, and we're going to see exactly where this thing is hitting. All right, fire in the hole. You hit the bullseye, look here. <laughs> That's as center as you can put one in that. <laughs> That's pretty lucky. Overall, I've got some shot above and below, but the majority of the shots are below it. It looks like it's a little bit low. Let's put another target up and shoot okay. a tungsten. Okay. Ooh, we. What are you talking about? <laughs> I believe we're in good shape. I believe you're in great shape. If you look at the number of kill oh, shots, look. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Very good. All right, Harold, now this is the setup I've been using for quite a few years turkey hunting. So this is my Winchester Super X2. This is really a duck gun, but I've got a turkey choke tube in it, and this is shooting Winchester long beards. So three and a half inch, five shot. A lot more recoil, a lot more gun to haul around, but let's see what this does and then compare this to the 20 gauge TSS. All right, if you already killed turkeys this gun, so evidently it's Should on, be on some. Should be on, yeah. we'll see. Very good. This is a very good pattern. I mean, it's all pretty tight. This is the same distance, 20 gauge TSS with a true lock choke tube. And this is the same gun I've had a lot of luck with hunting over the years. I believe I'm gonna start hauling less gun. Case closed, my friend, there's the difference. Well, Harold, I can't tell how much I appreciate you letting us come out here and shoot our guns today. I think we're both ready to hit the woods. You know where your gun shoots now, Chad? Yes, sir. And you know, it's very, very important for a turkey hunter to shoot his gun before he goes turkey hunting. Well, I'll tell you what, if I can only learn a few things about calling turkeys, maybe I'll fill my tags this oh, year. Oh, I bet you can call a turkey. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Dad. Yes, sir. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. Here today with Dane Balsman, program coordinator for our Fins League. That's fishing in the neighborhoods. Yep. Hey, the last time you and I were out, we caught a ton of fish out of Fins Lake. We did. We were up in Alexandria during the summer catching a lot of catfish, but uh, summer's not the only time to fish in Fins Lake, though. No. Tell me a little bit about wintertime fishing opportunities. No, there's year-round opportunities at these Fins Lakes. So during the winter, we stock a lot of trout as well. So starting in October, November, we start stocking trout. We stock about 120,000 in the Fins Lakes uh, around the state and we stock those through the early spring till water temps start to get too warm, usually about the end of May. There's some mixed reviews on fishing right around stocking times. Now, I know some people say, oh man, the fish 
You put them in, they don't want to bite for a little while. Now that's not what we experienced. We watched them go in and immediately caught as many as we wanted. And when that doesn't happen, when those fish don't start biting, people wonder, you didn't stock fish. But <laughs> sometimes the trout do take a little bit longer to acclimate. It can be a few days after the stocking before they really start biting, but uh, yeah. But, but if you want to know exactly when the fish are going in, we offer that information. Yep, we put that information out there a week or two before the fish are stocked. Um, go to the webpage, fw.ky.gov, type in fins, F-I-N-S, in the search engine, and uh, we have that trout stocking schedule as well as the catfish stocking schedule right online. Hey, we have 40-something fins lakes? 40, 44 fins lakes, 28 counties, and again, you can go to that fins uh, webpage, and we have directions how to get to the closest one near you. Hey, winter's no time to sit on the couch. You can still get out there and catch fish. It's not only for the summertime. I'd say I have fish fins lakes in the middle of the winter and they can be they can be very productive. They can. So we encourage people to get out when the weather's nice or when it's not nice. You can still have opportunities to catch fish in the winter at Fins Lakes. Thank you for telling us about the opportunity. Thank you, Chad. Protecting our water resources is everyone's responsibility. So understanding how to avoid the spread of zebra mussels is very important. Zebra mussels is a native species to Europe and Asia. And in fact, it's the Black and Caspian Sea area. It's a species that can be problematic. It has a free swimming larvae. When they reproduce, the little larvae, it's tiny, microscopic, can't see it, swims around in the water and it gets sucked into water pipes and then it attaches to the sides of pipes and things like that and starts to grow and it can clog pipes. So it's problematic, it's a nuisance species. The problem we have in this country is it was introduced uh, in the late 80s, early 1990s through probably barge traffic. They basically got into ballast waters of ships coming across from Europe and when they got to the Great Lakes, they released the water to exchange their, their ballast waters and all of a sudden these villagers are now in the water. They have gotten into areas where they've really done a lot of damage. They outcompete native mussels by getting thousands of them on a native shell and then basically taking all their food away from them. One of the ways that they're really problematic in the Great Lakes is just water intake structures. They're really damaging to that. If you've ever been around a beach with them, they're also very sharp. You can cut your fingers, your feet. They're just unwanted species. It's an exotic species. We don't want anything to do with them in this country and so we want to prevent the spread of them. Zebra mussels are currently found in Kentucky in a lot of our uh, larger rivers. Um, we've been fortunate enough to keep them out of a good majority of our lakes here, so it's really important to make sure that we dampen any type of movement, uh, human-mediated movement, um, into our lakes and resource systems where they're not currently found. Yeah, you can see, and you can see this one really good, the, the growth lines on it. One of the biggest um, modes of transport for these invasive species is human-mediated movement, and uh, we want to cut down on that vector of transport as much as possible. So it's really important that we um, do all that we can to, to slow down any progression or any instance where these um, mollusks can be introduced into previously um, untouched water resources. You know, most people in the state are aware of these. It's not like this is new. You know, this is, these things have been around. It's just that, you know, we haven't seen them transported into moss ball. That's the difference. So it's just a new vector to introduce them. Now they're being found in uh, a rather common aquarium um, and house decor item uh, known as a moss ball. They can also be known as beta buddies, sometimes shrimp buddies, some other product names. I mean, this is a previously undocumented vector of transport, and so keep in mind that is you should never ever dump anything from a bait bucket or an aquarium into a native waterway. That's going to be one of the main modes of transport for some of these species um, that could potentially be introduced into um, areas where they're not currently established. In terms of disinfecting um, and, and disposing of those right now, the current recommendations um, for anybody who's bought, say, marima moss balls or beta buddy balls, um, is one of three things. The easiest that I think is to, to probably freeze those uh, for 24 hours or longer, or you can boil those uh, or bleach them as well. And so that's one of the three ways um, that we're currently recommending that those be disposed of properly. Um, and never ever, again, dump them into a water resource, dispose of them properly in the trash. Spring is the time of year that many of our river systems become alive with fish activity, including trout. The 
let the trailer get your feet wet. <laughs> What do we have the opportunity to catch today? Um, well, the river's endless. Um, you know, there's walleye, stripers, brown trout, rainbow trout, brook trout, um, white bass, crappie. Um, really, crappie really, too. yeah, you oh, really wow. know, never know what you're going to catch. To be honest with you. Okay. In this rig you're throwing, how much weight are we throwing here? Um, I'm going to start out with a three eighths. Um, okay. It depends on the current. You know, it's just a basic Carolina rig. And then I use a number four Aberdeen crappie hook. Okay. Just a simple little hook. We just take a little dead shad, you hook it right through the eye. But you really want to wait until the boat starts drifting back. Okay. If you make it cast too quick, your bait, the boat will hesitate and your bait will just come right underneath the boat. I got you. Kind of wait on the boat to start going back just like you done. Here we go. There you go. Good here job. Out here. Let that rod tip do the work. Yep, so let the rod pull, tip do the work. Pull that fish out. We got a rainbow. That'd be a good eating size there. Yeah, yeah, it is. That's it. Look at there. Pretty fish. Beautiful fish. Yep. You've been catching these up to 10 pounds. Up to 10 pounds, yep. That's amazing. Unbelievable, really. It is, it is. That's yep. a pretty fish. I mean, the dinner bell is ringing <laughs> for these fish right now. Man, they just bounce and fight so well. Yeah. You got, got one too, huh? Yeah. I know, maybe we both got the same fish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a hungry fish right there. Yes, he was. He's like, hey, wait a minute. I'm hooked, but I'm still going to have lunch. <laughs> that one's probably too big to keep if you wanted to. You can't keep a rainbow between 15 and 20. Okay, so there's a slot left. Yep, here. and that one's definitely over 15. Yeah. Nice fish, though. Sure is. Big ones are in the first 100 foot right up there. Oh, really? Yep. Not always, but that's where the majority of the biggest trout are. Oh, that might be a lot bigger fish. <laughs> this thing's getting serious. Yeah, it take they don't wear out quick. <laughs> Lord have mercy, what a fish! It is a good fish. Oh wow, what a pretty fish! Yeah, it's a male. Got the big old hook on it. There, cool. there you go. Look Thank at you, this. Lord. <laughs> if you want to get him up in here. What a pretty fish. Yeah. Gorgeous. So you almost got 22. Almost 22 inches. Yep. Eight pound. Eight pounds. So they're so thick. I mean, you look across the back. I mean, they are. They're, yeah. they're just hauling weight everywhere. All the way out here on the end of its tail. That that that, yep. that fish has got weight. Yeah, it is. Just a beautiful fish. Sure is. How old do you think that fish is? You know, I really don't know. I wish I could tell you, but I really don't know. What put in this spring? I guess. No. <laughs> <laughs> Grow up. We go. This is a little bit better fish. This fish with the weight it's got is probably only two pound fish or so, but he might be a little bigger than two pounds. <laughs> Sometimes they grow when they get closer to the boat. <laughs> and when they get off, they get a lot bigger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what a pretty fish. Look at that joker. That, yeah. fish, that fish there is 25, 26 inches, isn't it? He's a long one. Five pounds. Five pounds. Yep. He's just skinny. Yeah, he is. You can see the color in that fish. They're just such a pretty, beautiful fish. They are. Spotted up. Beautiful. Nice he's so fish. skinny, I'd say he's not been up here very long. <laughs> fish that stay up here close to the dam very long, they really bulk up. I bet he runs right back up there I'd and gets so. him a snack. I'd say so. Come on now. Here we go. Here we go. Now this is a little better fish. Yep. You never know what you're gonna get in the yep. river. And it's such an interesting fight because you got a little bitty Aberdeen silver hook. I mean, a lot of times on eight pound tests, if I'm bluegill crappie fishing one of these, you can literally pull it straight. You can. So you gotta be so careful with a fish like this. Yep. You can't get in a hurry. Just about like fly fishing. Yep. 
Here he comes. Starting to shake his oh, head. It's a, it's a big brown. It's a big brown. I don't think it's as big as the one you caught, but it's, uh, it's probably, see him out there? Yeah, he's a it's nice It's probably one. a five or six pounder. Try to get him coming back this way. Beautiful. There you go, what a pretty fish. <laughs> wow, so I, I will tell you, that is the biggest brown trout I've ever caught. He'll weigh more than your rainbow did, because he's so fat. Yep, six. So, wow, <laughs> what, a, what a pretty, pretty fish. Gorgeous. So this is what this is what you come down here for. Like I said, I've been down here with you for a couple hours now, and I've caught the biggest rainbow and the biggest brown I've ever caught, and you caught a bigger brown than this one. <laughs> and man, they sure fight, and they yes, just they keep do. their weight yep. so far down in their tail, and it's just such a thick, beautiful fish. They're super healthy. Let's get this joker back Let's in. Let's get it back think? in. All right. What you got here, Lance? This is like a pretty good fish. Look like a good sized rainbow. There we go. There you go. What a nice fish. That's a good one there. Beauty. Wow, that's a good fish. What a pretty fish. Mm -hmm. I just can't thank you enough for this opportunity and You're think welcome, that buddy. this is out here. What Let's a see. resource. See how long she is. 20 inches. <laughs> Look at that rainbow. <laughs> wow. That's a good fish right there. Sure is. That's probably the longest one we caught. Wow. What a fish. What a pretty, beautiful. Nope, just about 20. Yeah. The first one you had was uh, probably our biggest, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Grow up, buddy. There's a whole lot of factors at play here. First, uh -huh. the water has to be right. Yeah. Because this water can change very, very quickly. It can. can. They post it on the app and their website, um, the generation schedule for the next day, but it says, you know, it can change at any time, so you can't always go by just what it says. I would highly recommend, if someone wanted to come down here and give this a try, to come down and to see exactly how to handle this and make sure that you're going about it safely because as with any moving water, big water like this, it can eat you up pretty good. Can yes, you? you definitely, which it is the law, but you definitely want to wear a life jacket mm -hmm. down here. And you're wearing a you're wearing a waist vest and people uh -huh. are saying, hey, where's his life jacket? You're wearing yeah. one. You wouldn't yeah. dare be caught out on this water without no, one. No, I you? would not. I mainly fish down here February, March, and April. The way I like to fish, the best fishing is when they've been generating 24-7. Okay, you know, you know and that's what we got right now. It's, and, and how many generators does it take to be able to do this? Two or more. Two or more, yep. and today we got five. Got five, so it's perfect. Okay, yep. all right. Let's go run back up. Let's do it. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Check out this nice 15 point buck that was taken by Jackson Haley. On the left you see a photo of the deer that was taken by his grandmother. Later on in the year he was able to harvest this deer. What a buck. Nice job. Here we have a nice 9 point buck that was taken by 10 year old Wyatt Sparks from Garrett County. Here we have an interesting buck taken by Diana Evans in Floyd County, Indiana. This is a 16 point non-typical buck. Nice job. Here we have Peyton Bryce Newsom who killed his very first deer in Lawrence County. This deer was taken with a muzzle loader. Seven year old Silas Harden of Flaherty, Kentucky took his first squirrel at a hunt on Fort Knox. Nice job. Here we have Anthony Kennedy with his first buck ever that was taken on Clarks River WMA in Marshall County. Nice deer. Here we have six-year-old Carl Ward with his first deer that was taken in Muhlenberg County, Kentucky. Here we have Bryce Cheney with his first deer, a nice doe shot with a 243 rifle in Boyd County. Check out four-year-old Gabby Mays with her first fish ever, a largemouth bass from a farm pond in Muhlenberg County. Nice job. Check out this impressive Trimble County buck that was submitted by Jim Huff. Here we have Sarah Atkins with a nice trout from Paintsville Lake. Nice catch. 
This week, I began hearing my first gobbles of the season. So make sure you're gearing up and getting ready for turkey season. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.